to me on camera. Mm. So, um, Colin, if I may. Must you? Yes. Um, what does consciousness have to do with artificial intelligence? <laughs> Start off with the simple ones, eh? Can't we just have a nice fireside chat about things? Consciousness and artificial intelligence. The role of consciousness in intelligence, whilst it's not agreed yet, um, won't fully be understood until we actually get a handle on consciousness itself. So it's a prerequisite to really understand how an artificial intelligence is going to work. If it turns out that consciousness is necessary for intelligence, for whatever reason, then not having it is a mission fatal thing. So uh, it's important. Is that enough of an answer? You started off with the easy things. I see. Yeah. <laughs> what does consciousness have to do with AI? Uh, what's your impression there, Randall? Look, you can have the finger of power. Uh, yeah, I, I wish I really knew what consciousness was, so I could properly answer that question. It seems that very often it gets conflated with things like self-awareness. And even when you go to consciousness conferences, like the one I went to fairly recently, a lot of the stuff that they talk about to indicate whether or not an animal has a certain level of consciousness are things like, does it recognize itself in a mirror? Does it recognize if there's something different about itself in the mirror and try to do something about it? Which seems like recognizing yourself and some sort of awareness, but I'm not sure that's exactly the same thing as consciousness. But then again, we have unconscious states and conscious states. And there is something different. And consciousness seems to have this inner play-by-play -play going on. So, yeah. But what does it have to do with AI? Good question. Is there any deeply held belief that you once harbored close to your past about consciousness which, you'd ha which you have subsequently had to overturn in light of research that you've uncovered? Hmm. You're asking me or...? I'm asking or both of you. <laughs> you go first because oh, you, you've got the finger. No. <laughs> oh, good answer. <laughs> Damn, cop out. <laughs> Uh, okay, I've actually done the reverse. I started off thinking it was optional and arbitrary and irrelevant and as I investigated I've come to the conclusion that we have to sort it out first and then we'll get a handle on intelligence. I think I missed a part earlier on where you were giving the little presentation or whatever it was for the beginning here and I, I kind of uh, wanted to know what, what is your again? take on uh, Wait, when we you were, were talking just about we were talking about the phenomenon of getting food on in front of camera oh really that's yeah, what it was. yeah that was important <laughs> okay <laughs> well uh, what, um, what in your mind um, is consciousness yeah okay I'm gonna be doing this in the talk but um, in 20 years of the scientific study of consciousness is actually quite well defined and um, there are a few terms that are quite specific and stable that have turned up that have been pinched from philosophers that apply to the discussion of it. Um, the technical term is, is phenomenal consciousness. And um, that is the subjective uh, qualities experienced from the first person. And that an explanation of consciousness involves explaining that. The, uh, first person perspective on the rest of the world which includes many facets um, from the visual scene to auditory to emo emotions touch taste all those things that are first person accessed uh, and apparently ineffable this this sounds extremely close to some of the definitions that I've heard of the concept of qualia yeah qualia and um, that's another word for but, but that sounds but it sounds like something that that has less to do with say for example the inner model of what's going on around you and whether you're unconscious or conscious in that sense but more to do with the way that things are being processed through the way that your neural nets happen to be set up and then of course that's true for 
anything that has neural processing capability, every one of them will process things slightly differently and therefore have a subjective experience of what's going on. Maybe not an aware experience. Maybe that has to be part of it as well. Maybe the additional thing that you also, that also makes something consciousness is that you have to have an awareness of the fact that you're experiencing it in addition to the subjective qualia. Um, I would say it's actually inverted, that, that uh, the existence of qualia creates the self, and the extent to which that the qualia inform you ab and about yourself uh, will determine the, the extent to which you can behave and the complexity in which you can behave in respect of yourself, like mirror self-recognition is only possible in some of the higher mammals. Um, but that in itself doesn't create qualia. Phenomenal consciousness creates the self, which can then process the self and, and be intelligent in respect of the self. That would be my slant on that mm -hmm. particular aspect of it. I'm going to give it a I guess I guess we'd have to go all the way back and, and debate exactly what are qualia before even going on to the well, bigger question. Because yeah. if you just say qualia are the subjective experience, mm -hmm. then it's just, okay, you set up a network in a certain way, put the weights in a certain way, and that's the way your experience turns out. That's how the input gets processed. And then anything that has a network with a specific setup of weights processes in a certain way. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. That um, would be qualia. That... I, that I would uh, disagree with pretty much completely in, the, in one sense in that there's no explanation of qualia in there that doesn't presuppose some kind of um, the, the role of information processing in delivery of qualia. And I think it's more fundamental than that in that you can talk about the first pers person perspective of anything. This microphone, that jug of beer, this table, me, mm -hmm. right? And a scientific account of qualia should speak to those circumstances. If it's not like anything to be that glass of beer, then a scientific account of it should include a reason for that. I'm getting lost though, because when you say it should also account for the subjective experience of this glass of beer or yeah. something like that, I don't see the difference. I mean, I wasn't saying that it had to be a direct, say, sensory input, then run through some neural system and get you out, but it could be something else. Let's say that the processing is done differently. But processing yeah. does seem to be a part of it, because when you're off, when you're, when you're knocked out, when, you know, it, it can disappear. It's not yeah. like this is always yeah. going on. There is some kind of processing going on. And is it really a huge difference whether that is direct processing of sensory input or if it's processing of memories or processing of a whole bunch of different types of input that are being put together? Some of them memories, some of them goals, some of them input. It's being processed. So the, the, the real difference there, it just eludes me. I'm not quite sure what's the difference here. Your way of experiencing the beer is different than mine, sure, but it's still just the way that the net's set up, basically. And whether it's a network, whether it's other stuff, that's really not the important thing. The important thing is something's being processed. Okay. Without the processing, can, to me, this doesn't exist. Yeah. I can, let's take a brain and do a, a mental process of spreading it out to the size of the solar system, where it's still computing the same information, maybe a little slower. Okay. so spread out but if you spread it out and mixed it all up and maybe even changed some of the some of it to different components with the same functionality yeah. um, I if asked I would say that the the original would have qualia and the second even though it functionally processes the same way wouldn't and you, even though you just said that whatever the hell it is you have to put in there, functionally it's processing in exactly the same way. Mm -hmm. But because you happen to have moved things around a bit and exchanged some components, mm -hmm. it no longer has qualia. Yeah. Yeah, this is... So at yeah, this, this moment I have absolutely no, no idea what you mean why. by qualia anymore. Yeah. Well, um, it, I suppose it's going to come down to an understanding of the brain. 
Well, well first, we should understand what you mean by qualia. Yeah. Otherwise, we don't know how to debate this. I've already I've already said that. But but what you said sounded to me exactly like processing something because you said it's a subjective experience. But subjective yeah, experience to me is something you just get out of the way that you're processing something. That um, makes it subjective because you process differently than I do. No, I would I don't. I think that there could be qualia without any processing at all. But it sounds like you're just taking a word, just call something X. I could say that there's, there are gym of something. You know, just saying it's qualia, but not explaining to me what the difference is between the way I process this and the way you process it, does not explain to me what qualia are. Um, yeah, it's a problem, isn't it? It, it certainly is, because yeah. if we don't know how to communicate, how to communicate about it, it yeah. it becomes very hard so, to decide. Yeah, where well, here we have that. two people who, who have come at this issue from very different approaches and, and and kind of it's not that we uh, neither of us can really claim to have an access to the ultimate truth whatever's oh, going absolutely on absolutely not i'm just but trying in, to be able to trying talk. to talk to each other where <laughs> we're shooting past each other yes. in a way which is very difficult to encounter yeah and i imagine that over time as we become more adept at the at at describing these sorts of things to each other, maybe there'll be an improvement, and I hope that that over the next, you know, ten years or something, as things become better, better defined, mm -hmm. that we might make some progress. And I'm hoping to contribute my little bit this weekend. So I'm I'm very curious because for me it's very hard to understand what yeah. you mean by qualia. Yeah. So I would really like to know what Adam thinks qualia are from your description. Okay. Well, let's interview the interviewer. <laughs> um, I, I'm not really an expert like with qualia, I, an expert. I, I have thought about the possibilities of what it might mean, so if I may offer that instead. Um, I think it can be described by an, an analogy, analogy, so if you have an inner experience of red, which we all know is a common sort of thought yeah. experiment. Is it the same as somebody else's inner experience? No. I think you can take it another step further. Yeah. Um, I think those who think that qualia can't be measured don't believe that it. you can take an experience of pain uh -huh. as a pattern and put it in a box and keep it there. But what does it mean as putting a it in a box? Patterns by themselves don't mean anything. So everything, well, well, everything's in reference. Patterns only mean something in association in with something yeah. else. Yeah. Yeah, so the only right. reason why people have different experiences of red is because they have different associations. That's right. And so, as a thought experiment, could you take that experience of red or the experience of pain, right? Um, put it in a box. Oh no! And, and, and let, let me just finish, and then take that experience and try and transfer it into another mind. Would it be no. the same thing? Without all the same associations, how could you possibly do that? So to me, qualia is simply the association of the stimuli and its interpretation with um, the agent experiencing it. Okay. Does that make I, sense? I have no idea if this is what you mean, but to me no. that makes a lot I of mean, sense. It's, it, it's an interpretation of a very difficult word, but it doesn't explain anything. And I, until we explain things, I think we're going to have trouble. So, I mean, from our perspectives, you, I imagine, have an information processing slant on, on the... People the say this, but saying information processing slant is also just taking a term and applying it. Yeah, I what have I, to the choose slant some that word. I have, the what, slant you that I have tell me. Yeah. is that mind is something that is being generated by brain. It is yeah. not something that is just popping up all by itself somewhere. If you don't have a brain, there's no mind. That's good, hence, that's empirically validated. Hence, by, by the physiology of the brain and how it works, how yeah. all these pieces are working together has a part to play in how this mind comes about and all of its experiences. Mm -hmm. And figuring out what those are, coming up with representations that describe exactly what is going on there so that we can understand how these parts are generating that experience, that's what I'm interested in doing. And I don't care what you call it, whether it's information processing or whether it's yeah. system identification or control theory or whatever else. I don't care about analog, digital, all this stuff. Yep. 
Not the point. Right. The point is trying to understand what is going on in this physiology that's yeah. generating mind. Yeah. That's my take on it. Well, I've been invited to a conference um, that's very much about panpsychism. Now, you know, Ben Goetzel is very, very into panpsychism. Um, and I think it's... Yeah, but I forget what it means. Oh, I think it's got, it's very much got to do with the idea that consciousness or the, the qualia doesn't actually exist as a relationship between the, um, the experience phenomena and the interpretation of it or whatever. But it is an inherent property of the universe, is that right? Yeah, you'd say that everything the constituents, this, the, the structural primitives of the universe contain within them intrinsically those, the components that are assembled into a first person experience in brains but may elsewhere take a different form but it's, it's assembled from a basic unit and it exists everywhere. That's the general idea of it. As I understand. But what sort of basic units is he talking about? Like, what what would be different than, say, the basic units that every physicist talks about? Um, the, uh, yeah, well, that. Oh, gee, you know how to ask questions, don't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the, what the universe is made of, and what physicists currently describe the universe as being made of, yeah. are two separate things. They're not necessarily related to each other. Well, physicists are just trying to describe phenomena, right? Yes. I mean, they, they, they the see phenomena, phenomenon? and they try to come up with ways to yeah. represent it, to make it understandable. Mm. And so they've got one way of looking at it, and that's the way they're, they represent it. But you could take a different slant. You could describe yeah. it differently if you wanted to. Mm. Um, again, how is this different from pan... What is it called again? Pan-psychism. Pan -psychism. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's interesting. It's, yeah, I think it's got a lot to do with the way you describe things will lead you to different outcomes. It's like the difference between continental philosophers oh, yeah, and yeah, yeah. the analytic okay. philosophers. In oh, sense. I like this because this is, this is actually related to one of the issues that I, that I find important in, in discovering how the brain works and doing things like augmentation, which is namely the, the uh, competition between what I, again, those terms, again, terminology, what I call wisdom and, uh, and youth. So the, the <laughs> yes, uh, uh, bear with me. So wisdom being the fact that you've experienced a lot of things and it's set up all these associations and you are therefore always filtering everything in terms of certain patterns and just, it makes you react faster, you're experienced, you know how to deal with stuff. But it also means you only have one certain way of looking at things. Whereas someone who is a blank slate basically can come up with very many different ways of looking at things. And that's the advantage youth has over age, whereas age is mm -hmm. much more able to deal with things quickly. Um, I'd like to have both. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to have a switch. <laughs> click. Yeah. Oh, lots of novelty around. Uh, I might not cope. You know. So, so actually, that's Youth. one of those things. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to be able to look at things differently as well yeah. if I wanted to. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. It'd be good if we could just switch our um, sort of perspectives like that. In in a sense, I think people try and achieve that through meditation um, and through other guidance practices and mm. I think you know some of it might be valid uh, although I haven't really delved a lot into that has either of you um, spent a long time meditating um, so I haven't spent an enormous amount of time meditating but I've had some really interesting conversations ever since Dmitry Itzkov popped up as my main supporter right now um, Who? Dmitry Itzkov he's a Russian entrepreneur and Oh, right. internet personality yeah, who uh, has taken on an interest in based brain in things. New York and he has an organization set up in New York, but he he's still mostly based out of Moscow. Um, and he, he comes at... So what did he do to you to... He, he comes at all of this from a uh, spiritual Buddhist background. Yeah. And so he talks a lot about things like how the self is really something that doesn't actually exist, but that's just basically being generated. And the, and yeah. the same for societies and the bigger selves, in a sense. Yeah. And to me, of course, coming from a neuroscience background, well, not really a neuroscience background, but eventually, um, that all makes sense. That all seems perfectly normal yeah. because every little neuro ensemble is generating its own little world based on what's mm -hmm. coming into it and what it's doing to it. And then together they're creating this Collective. self sensation. And then all of us, because we're not alone, we're ind not independent, we're constantly communicating, we're generating something as well. It makes complete sense. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought that was really interesting just because I couldn't imagine that people thousands of years ago figured this out, you know, deductively in some way. 
without yeah, having a modern sense of science. Yeah. So. But then Anders Sandberg said maybe it means we're just wired to come up with that explanation. It may be that we were, yes, wired that way because if we did, we survived. Mm. It would be just a Darwinistic interpretation. Those yeah. who did that did Survived better. and the others, yeah. Mm. There's a lot of evolutionary clues which um, were not necessarily the best way to look at the world so as to approach truth, but just to get by um, and survive. Oh, yeah. So. Methodology. I'm interested. Um, You're striking it's interesting, your beard like, in a very wise fashion. Well, I'm, 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 I'm putting the pieces together <laughs> in my mind now. Um, in terms of meditation and different states of mind, like the sort of communication that we have here and the type of communication we have through our digital selves, and I brought this, brought digital selves up before, mm. is very different. Uh, we have a lot more bandwidth of information being sort of suggested in our like uh, our gesticulations, our expressions mm. and other things, mm. not just our it's words. Complex. It's complex. But online it, it seems to be quite linear and, and the bandwidth is a lot thin more thin. However Especially you can on suggest dating a sites. lot. <laughs> yes, exactly. You can <laughs> you can suggest a lot. Um, like you can quickly post uh, an update and inform thousands of people within the space of seconds. Yeah. Um, and is that a different form of consciousness? Is this like a different form of like, um, like a, I don't know, perceiving the world through our digital selves? Mm. And will that change the more we don avatars in the future? Probably. I our certainly, perception. I feel like I'm there and existing in some subjective sense when I'm doing things online. I feel like then I'm immersed in that, and that's part of what's going on. It's me, it's like I'm watching what's going on here, I'm posting something. It's definitely a subjective experience, and it is different than this, there's no doubt. Yeah. And as the technologies become more and more immersive, you can imagine these different modes of relationship with uh, friends and community and the mm. wider world will become more and more sophisticated and probably very unfamiliar to our forebears. They would have no clue what the hell a relationship with a Twitter <laughs> forum is all about. I no still have no clue all. how to relate to Twitter. A name like Twitter, yeah. I, I, I think it, people I became would believe a Twitch it had recently. something to do with, it, with being sort of. Yeah. I've got a tweet 42 here. friends. Mm. I found. I've finally hammered my way to 42. Wow. Mm. I'll follow you. <laughs> yeah, all right. I think I followed you. <laughs> Sorry, mm. yeah, I've got that many. Like, uh, yeah. I've only really just picked up Twitter mm. properly in the last like month. Yeah. Um, as soon as I got Twitter deck, but it's interesting. We we care about our avatars as well as our self image. So it seems we we, we seem to uh, be merging our self image with our digital selves. Well, those um, they're, they're alter egos in a sense. I mean, well, yeah. you've got to manage a Twitter presence in a, to suit a certain end. And it's not you, but it's some version of you that you want to present to the world yeah. for purposes that are only yours. And um, what is it like when you've got ten of those with ten different... You've got a Facebook presence and a Twitter presence and a, some other presence, mm -hmm. you know, Gmail or something, or a, an email form. It becomes really hard, I've noticed, to, to manage many of the social yeah. networking streams um, and, you know, be immersed in them all. But maybe... I think the technology is to integrate them and to sort of make them manageable from one point is becoming more and more realisable. Yeah. At least it's Tumblr. Tumblr, yeah. Tumblr or about.me, yeah. Sorry? I haven't done that. What's that no, about? No, I, I did I haven't either until very recently. Mm. I just yeah. stumbled across it. Apparently you you come up yeah. with one thing you want to post, one blog item, and you can put it everywhere on your Facebook and your Twitter oh, and okay. it's just, you've sold me. Yeah. So we should call it Splatter. Yeah, yeah it's kind of... <laughs> Scattergun, yeah. <laughs> Scattergun, yeah. Actually, I can tell you about my... Um, uh, well, small, in, small little dabbling with, with meditation mm -hmm. in that I think I've only ever actually done it once. I've tried relaxation a fair bit, relaxation yeah. systems of audio prompting, but I think I actually got, only got into a meditative state once. And for that period, I was fascinated by what was going on. I, 
from the inside, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure I could observe the left-right binocular rivalry taking over oh. from one side to the other, and it was in the ah. form of a kind of slightly grey, no, slightly off black swirliness that was originating on one side and moving one way, and then it would get confused, and then it would move the other way. And so I sat there for 25 minutes just watching this happen. That? Just watching. I mean, was this happening just to you, or was it something you were actually doing? No, no, it was happening to me. I was just observing it. And, uh, and it matched my measurements. Uh, my measurements of left-right binocular rivalry using those visual tools. Um, everyone has their own kind of binocular rivalry footprint where you, you process one side and then swap to the other and back in mind seems to stabilize on about 15 seconds one side and then the other. Other people are a lot faster and this what matched kind of it. Drink, 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 drink. Bring it on. What kind? It should just be uh, There's not a lot to choose from so take your pick. Yeah. I want to do it again but I haven't been able to get to that state. Yeah I've, I've never been in a meditative state like that. Yeah. I've tried self-hypnosis but that really just gets you to relaxation yeah not to meditation in that sense. This was unusual in that it was a very restive um, environment and it was uh, the particular circumstances were conducive, I think. And, and so, yeah, I, I want to do that again, but not, not for, for mental restorative purposes, just for curiosity, yeah, it's, just it to go through. It really interesting yeah. to say, yeah. yeah. And I came out of it and, it and I did have that whatever that zen flush is that you get from being relaxed like that. It was uh, amazing. And it all depends on what the definition of the word is, is. That's the other one, right? Yeah, when you do these philosophical things, especially over beer, you seem to end up with those questions. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, National Science Week has been quite like enthusiastic about spreading the memes of science but very much in the format of memes because they're all yeah. about you know the importance of of how a bubble in a beer works <laughs> mm. no well that's it's my pretty important in the past so looking at those bubbles well it is, it is pretty things. important to know how bubbles yeah. work that way you know you don't waste beer trying to pour it <laughs> <laughs> and guinness is the worst of the lot that was a bit, uh, pathetic pouring effort by adam mm. Oh. Mm. There are these odd little tidbits that you pick up everywhere in, in, odd, in some places, like yeah. online, when you're on your online pl presence. I, so, for example, I learned that uh, in the airline industry for the, the flight attendants, the worst drink you can order is a Coke Zero. This is the, uh, I don't know if that? it's called a Coke Zero here. But is that because it yeah, explodes in 0.8 atmospheres? No, it's, it's because <laughs> it takes forever to settle. So they have to pour uh, a little bit, then yeah. they have to go uh, serve so other customers, like pour a little bit again, yeah. and it just takes forever. And mm. people are constantly ordering it everywhere because, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But then again, you know, they, they have a choice. They could just take it off the menu. So. If it's expensive to pour, they should get rid of it. Yeah, that, that'd be easier. Just take it off the menu and mm. use Diet Coke or something. Mm. So, I think it's the same thing. Mm. I think Diet Coke and Coke Zero are exactly the same thing, except Coke Zero is for men because it sounds tougher. Really? Diet. really? So they're exactly the same? Oh, I think so, so it's a blokey one. Yeah. I don't have either of them because just there are many reasons for not drinking it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. James, yeah. James is addicted to Coke, I must say. But anyway, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear different people's definitions of transhumanism. <laughs> Do you have a working definition of transhumanism there, Colin? <laughs> no. <laughs> that, actually, that, yeah, I can use that word. That was your good answer. I'm having that one. I don't no. have no. No. <laughs> no. So I'd you. say take three grams of qualia. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I don't know. Transhumanism. Wow. Yeah, well, we did talk about it in the car. And yeah. I think we, we came to some conclusions that I actually agree with, which are that transhumanism is really no different from discussing what people have been doing all the time, which is augmenting themselves, changing, going beyond what their biology has made possible, like having beers and having these machines tape what we're doing and wearing clothes. Glasses. Glasses, of course. And cochlear implants. And yeah. Except that transhumanism implies that you are focused on this way forward and that you are more radical about it. And to me, that's both 
the explanation of why people pursue transhumanism because they really see the value in doing that more radically, doing it more extreme. Uh, just really saying, yes, this is the path to go, is to augment more, augment faster, understand that that's what's happening and just accept it. At the same time, it's the thing that causes the confrontation because things that sound radical and extremist do that. Because it seems like you're focused only on this and you're forgetting that. Mm -hmm. Like you're forgetting the people starving in Africa because you're so focused on your technology or something like that. So to me, that's why people go, oh, transhumanism sounds Discarding little... humanity. Yeah. yeah. What's humanity? I mean, people often think that it's unnatural and, and get a gut reaction, a sort of visceral reaction against any technology that replaces part of us that we associate with being human. Yeah. Um, like a heart. Like a heart, yes. Yeah. When that was first done by that South African surgeon, you know, people were, were wondering, you know, is that person who's got this artificial thing or the uh, transplanted thing, you know, are they any less or more human than they were before? It's a very interesting thing that that was, uh, that, that was controversial mm. because uh, now when you think of people with cochlear implants, yeah. to me that's a much bigger question mm. because there you have a device that's actually affecting the way that sensory input reaches your mind and mm. how it's being processed. Yeah. And I don't think that the heart was quite as significant no. in that sense. Because you can't see it. But, but remember, there was a lot of culture um, and a lot of folklore around the heart being the center of, yeah. of um, love and of feeling. Yeah. I remember one of and Aristotle's wisdom. more impressive cock-ups where he, <laughs> he thought the brain was a blood-cooling device. That's right. And everything was centered on the heart. Mm. And, and intelligence was a result of the four humans. Oh, Black, yeah. bile, phlegm, yeah. and blood. Yeah. And that, and yeah. out of that arose intelligence, or that was and medicine for that matter. Mm. That early yeah. medicine, yes. 200 AD or BC, or whatever. So that's a lesson into why it's important to do empirical yeah. science as well. <laughs> you can very quickly discover which part is relevant. Is doing what? To Another one of yeah. Aristotle's spectacular cock-ups was um, flies having eight legs. Ooh, really? Yeah, it took a thousand years for that to be but empirically <laughs> refuted. <laughs> what? <laughs> Somebody in about the 12th century sat down and actually counted them. <laughs> Instead of going, oh, Aristotle said they've got eight legs, so they must have eight legs. This, this one's one missing too. <laughs> this one is <laughs> missing too as well. Yeah, yeah. So many injured. Damn. There's a lot of mutant flies, flies around here. <laughs> yeah, I like That's Aristotle. Scary. He must have had a sense of humour, I reckon. Even though he's cocked up a lot. Yeah. Aristotelian physics was quite out there, wasn't it? Um, well, he might... defined the term metaphysics, as far as I know, which has dogged us to this very day. So, yeah. so what, does, what does metaphysics mean? What, I mean, how is it used in well, today's I, world? Um, if you listen to my talk on the weekend, I won't discuss discuss it directly but uh, metaphysics is used to account for causality and it's sort of like about physics not not the actual physics where actual physics is like what the stuff that what the guys do in the physics department you know correlate phenomena mm. and uh, so when you talk about causality which is not derivable from correlating phenomena mm -hmm. then you're talking about the underlying um, an inaccessible heart of the universe you know, that they used to call the noumena, the, under, the underneath bit. And to talk of um, ex so called explanations of, of that is to talk about metaphysics where you, uh, everything with an ism on the end of it is, is a metaphysical account of causality. Functionalism, computationalism, eliminativism. Anything else isn't. That's my my take on that. I don't think it's done us much good to uh, to do that over the last two thousand years. And if I had to choose, I'd say that was Aristotle's biggest cocker. It's just my prejudice on the matter. It's interesting. Mm. So, um, does it have anything to do with virtual worlds? I mean, if you create a, physic, um, a physics 
in a virtual world? Not really, no. 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 Okay. <coughs> well, that kind of ties in, anyway, to the importance that you see uh, of the need for the for physic the elements of physics to be replicated in the substrate that can compute intelligence. Oh yeah. Oh, you're talking about the approaches. Yes. To yes. creating h hardware that is capable of right. being intelligent. Yeah. Yeah. And that'll probably be another one of the differences between you. Mm. Yeah. You know how to find these things. Mm. Yeah, I'm into replication, whereas everyone else is into emulation and simulation and stuff. So, now you actually have a, uh, I guess a companion, in George Church. The, uh, George Church. Yes, the, the, the of the Church DNA. Turing. Or oh no 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 the Church who's known for his work in uh, DNA in uh, the Human Genome Project. Oh because really? He's recently turned his interests to the brain. Yeah. And he's wanted to uh, basically scan the whole thing, the whole, you know, what we're also interested in, the whole brain emulation type of thing, except he doesn't want to emulate, he wants to scan it and then create a replica by printing it, basically. Okay. Because he also okay. believes that it's, well, actually, it's not because he believes that the matter is important to generating intelligence. It's because he believes that it is very difficult to come up with the right descriptions and it's yeah. easier to just build it build with it. the same blocks. Well, building it has a, a huge and um, a huge history. And in fact, it's been the most prominent way of making scientific progress. It's only been the last 50 to 60 years since computers came along that people have had an alternative. Um, prior to that, what you did was replicate. The Wright brothers replicated flight. Yeah, but they didn't use feathers. No, but they replicated the physics of flight. Whatever the whatever goes on around a bird's feathers, I, they made a, a physical version that, of it. I would say that that the plane is a. I mean, of course, it's a model of flight. It's a model implemented in plywood and and other stuff like that. If you're building a replica by making a chip that does neuromorphic functions, for example. Mm -hmm. That's also a kind of model of how a neuron works using different materials. If you are building it by devising a program that replicates the activity that's going on inside a digital computer, it's also another way of using different materials but making a model just like the Wright brothers did. Yeah, I think we're going to have really a, see the difference there. I think the word model, I think, might be under, underlie any difference between us, because I, I don't... There, is, there are people would call a model aeroplane as a, as a kind of a scaled down version of a, mm -hmm. of a real aeroplane. If it flies. Oh yeah, fine. It's, yeah. it's replicating flight, but... Exactly. That's the point. You need to know what you're trying to replicate. And if, yep. you, can, if you can figure out what you're trying to replicate, replicate. the yep. behavior you're trying to get, the thing you're trying to capture, and then you know which signals you're looking for, then this is why I talk about system identification. Mm -hmm. Then you could come up with a way to make the right representation. So, sure, maybe there's some aspect of some of the physics and the materials involved where we're missing the right type of signals that we're actually looking for, the right interaction between components because maybe we don't quite know which effects we're trying to capture. Yeah. But if we do know what we're trying to capture, if we're right that, for example, spike timing underlies things like uh, sensory perception, it underlies motor action, it underlies the way memories are laid down in synapses, then perhaps that's enough. Mm. It really comes down to whether we know what we're trying to capture and which signals they are that, that affect them between these, these yeah. different parts. Well, I suppose the departure in, in the case of the word model, mm. in, in so far as modern engineering would take it, usually involves some kind of computed uh, mathematical representation of the physics that's going on in the original natural system, and uh, and if if a computed model of a brain was able to be a brain, right? Then yeah, computed but, flight should but fly. That's, not that's the way that I approach okay, it. Okay, so yeah, there's a linguistic issue here because yeah. it's whether you call just the description of a model, the model, yeah. as in the math, 
or if you call the functional model, the one that you can actually give input to that churns through it and produces mm -hmm. output, the model. So when I talk about a model, it's the latter. It's the okay. one that actually churns through things. So it's not yep. the representation itself, yep. it's taking that representation and implementing it on the emulator, on those parts that actually make it move, like the, the little model airplane that can also fly. So you, it's not enough to just get the data. You need to have the the bits that make that data do something. Yeah. You need to have the emulators there. If that is the case, then I think the difference between what I would call replication and your approach are, are really come down to which parts of the original natural hmm. system yeah. are necessary. I mean, oh, fundamentally and there's, necessary. There's certainly still plenty to debate. Yeah. There. Yeah. yeah. So that the difference, that those differences would be the ones that determine yeah. the the, yeah. the final physical implementation of, of, yes, of course. the yeah. replicated system. So that being the case, it's probably if I had to guess, I'd probably say that my my model, my my understanding of the necessary physics that's going on in here has is twofold. Uh, this, and it's what my PhD thesis was about, mm -hmm. and that there are two aspects to brain operation spikes mm -hmm. but there's also a huge electromagnetic field system and both of them mm -hmm. are necessary yeah. so if I, was, if I was to replicate the operation of brain tissue yeah I would replicate both of them right. so I'd need new hardware to express the fields yeah. as well as do the signaling yeah and this together they interact mm -hmm. uh, so I'm set about building chips that will include those two mm -hmm. things that would be my position and I, and I have to empirically justify it by building it and testing it and right. seeing if it makes the difference um, but until I do that, I, I can just say that's my position. Yeah. I'm running with it. My position is, is, is really that I don't have a position. My position is I want to make the thing that works. Yeah. Well, and, me too. And as I, as I discover what may be missing, as in this hasn't got everything, then you need to add something. That's but I, yeah. I believe in iteratively creating better systems. Mm -hmm. So you need to start somewhere. Mm -hmm. And starting with the spikes, kind of makes sense because yep. we know all these places where it affects something but we also know that electric fields affect neurons then yeah. there's been some recent work that shows yeah. exactly um, that weak electric fields affect yeah. neuron firing mm -hmm. so the question is just is that you know is it completely washed out in what the spikes are doing mm -hmm. anyway or is it is it something that you need and maybe even if you leave the spikes out can you still see some kind of phenomenon no, just the spikes the actually fields? cause the field that's what so, my phd is about <laughs> well, of course they do cause the field but let's just yeah. say that if you had just the electromagnetic field but you didn't have the spikes if there were some way to test that if you could do that maybe you could find out if they were really essential i don't know yeah. but my point is just start somewhere and then iteratively improve the yeah. model. And I, I'm not dogmatic about it because mm. I really don't care to be right about this assumption or that assumption. I just want the end result. Yeah, well, some people are very devout. They've decided that this particular aspect is the thing mm -hmm. and nothing will sway them. And it sounds yeah, I find really that similar, very actually. strange, really, why yeah. people do that. Yeah, me too. And I've actually arrived at my position by pretty much the same approach as you. I. I've gone along and investigated and I've found the relative importance of different kinds of things that are going on in a brain yeah. and managed to focus down on two, two fundamental things of which there are a gazillion really a variants. Shame that I didn't get to give my presentation yeah. here because so much of what we're talking about mm. now was in that presentation Yeah. when I gave it over at uh, what's the campus called again? Monash. 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 Yeah. 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 That's where I did my undergrad. Yeah. It's my alma mater, the farm they used to call it. The farm? Uh, yeah, because it was a farm once. <laughs> I was thinking 1984. And, yeah. like, no, 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 stuff. not that farm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the same. Uh, but yeah, you can't, it, it just goes to show you can't always rely on technology. Mm. Shall I pour you another? Oh, yes. Oh. It's good. Oh, look, uh, it's great that you guys can sort of... <laughs> gentlemanly politely disagree on some things <laughs> i love this stuff you know mm. Mm. i'm not yeah. here to defend anything to the death <laughs> it's just fun <laughs> yeah um there, there's a loo there on the corner of the building just there See the, right on the very corner oh, oh i see okay yeah. there's some kind of talk going on in there so you can't even really just walk around or something. Uh. oh there's marky 
What's he talking oh, he's about? Representing the GSA, Graduate Student Association. So, talking about like uh, replicating the model that uh, the brain, that the human brain uses in order to compute um, by developing bio-inspired chips, for instance. What would be the main extra information uh, um, that you'd achieve by doing that? I mean, as far as I know, it's just elect electromagnetic field um, yeah. interaction. Mm -hmm. Is that right? Or a fact? Yeah, there, but there is a uh, a lot of information content in the field itself. Mm. The field results from millions of superposed, superimposed contributors. And the net field system is extraordinarily complex and contained, and it, and it does contain information it, over and above, emergent from, um, over and above the contributions from all the myriad sources in there. So it's been pretty much neglected for technical reasons for 50 years. It's been debated about, and now we've got the technology to deal with it in ways that we couldn't before. So it's worth considering in all the um, models of brain operation. When you say it contains information, yeah. to me it, it's like, okay, um, you know, half of, think of a string, half of the string is contained in um, the action potential and maybe the other half is contained in a fapsis for it to yeah. go with you. But it's not really like that. It's not like, no. you know, some bits are in the uh, um, in the electromagnetic pulse or a fapsis and the other the other information... They're cross-correlated. Yeah, you sit there. Yeah, yeah. So, but it's cross-correlated. Um, and so you don't think... Uh, well, may maybe it's true of the human brain, but that would suggest you don't think that we'll be able to achieve the richness of information without using electromagnetic fields yeah. and only um, sort of an equivalent to an action potential. Um, what I think if will happen is the capacity to encounter novelty will be impaired. Mm. It's the dynamics. It's not just there's knowledge and then there's learning. Right? And you can achieve a lot of knowledge um, but learning is about the adaptation of, of knowledge and that is where the field system comes into its own. So what would happen in a system without the fields would be that it would um, be impaired in its ability to adapt to novelty. So you train it to do chess, you then stick it in front of a game of backgammon. <laughs> yeah. Tries to make chess out of it. But that's an extreme example. But that's what. Yeah, mm. That's what interesting. Mm. So it's a subtle effect, and it's at the margins, but it's very important in adaptation. That would be my approach. The fields themselves could actually you could get rid of them in, a, in an environment where uh, nothing changed much. So I've, I mean, my background is in memory and learning. Mm. Um, and mostly about all the different stages that you go through in episodic mm -hmm. learning. And then when it gets from uh, a short-term buffer to yep. LTP, to being repeated inside the hippocampus yeah, over and over it's again, to being into associated with something that gives it basically a tag that kind of says, yeah, okay, this is a new concept, delivering it out into the rest of the system where it associates back again to the original patterns that were active when it was first experienced. Yeah then eventually integrating with more patterns as you use it over time, over and over again, yep. and it becomes long-lasting memory. Yep. So there are all these different stages. Now this last part, where it, it becomes long-lasting memory, and it becomes much easier to access because you have many more associative roots to get at it. At least that's my theory as to yep. why it becomes easier to access. It's part of your everyday experience yep. then. It's, it's something that you really know. Um, to me, that's where the adaptation and the novelty aspect lies is the fact that you have associated with so many things that it it becomes usable in many different ways that it wouldn't otherwise have been. Well, I think, yeah, again, we're going to have a terminology. When I say Probably. novelty, I mean <laughs> something I that's question. really radi radical novelty, where you've, you've had a whole, you know, your life hasn't involved, I don't know, tennis. <laughs> so, mm. And then all of a sudden, you're confronted by the concept of tennis. It's but you've seen tennis different. balls, or at least balls of some maybe, shape. Maybe you've you seen people moving, things like maybe that. Maybe let's take Martian tennis, whatever that is. 
something okay. really different. You need a way of encountering the novelty in a way that's, I mean, an evolutionary sense, in a way that's survivable. So you can, okay. you can justify evolution choosing a, a brain operation which would select for things that would allow mm. survivable encounters with novelty. Oh yeah, I agree. That, There's absolutely the, a selection all for All your history novelty. is yes. suddenly irrelevant. Right? Yeah. Here's novelty, it's in your yeah. face. The big animal you've never seen before. Yeah. Um, that kind of thing. And so that, that would, that's right. wh where if you have a highly habituated, let's say tennis again, mm -hmm. right? And somebody does a shot you've never seen before in tennis, mm -hmm. then you, yeah, you're right. You, you'd be very likely to be able to adapt what, you've, what you know because mm -hmm. of your experience about tennis mm -hmm. to the novel tennis situation. Yeah, that's very different. And that's a different yeah. kind of novelty. Yeah. No, your kind of novelty is more the kind where it is so different from everything that is there yeah. that it turns on a, a high susceptibility to yeah. learning, to grabbing, grasping this it, new it, data. I'd even go so far as that when you travel to a new country, you know that at the end of the day you're absolutely exhausted because yeah. non-stop from every direction you've been confronted with novelty and your brain is operating in a different mode and assimilating information that is that is completely new to you yeah. and but two or three days later it's not quite the same and right. you're, you're like hell you're in Australia under a tree at the moment I imagine you know but you may be able to remember episodes much better once it's no longer that novel that's the other yeah. interesting side it's kind of like looking at small children and they're learning yeah you know how in the first couple of years they basically don't have any long-term memory they're not really remembering Ooh events as they're happening much episodic memory. because how could you possibly form an episodic memory of what happened yesterday when you don't even know how to remember that there was a cup and a table and yeah. seeing things and crawling all these basic things need to be established yeah. first before you can start remembering events that involve them yeah so it takes a while to even get to the, the point you where know, you can make a spatial map that's ta a tag to it attach right. memories yeah. to is yeah. not formed mm. and you can flog a kid to death to learn pi to 20 decimal places yeah. But when they're two and a half years old, and they'll do it, but then two years later, they'll, they won't have a clue. Yeah. Hi, what's there's that? There's a, <laughs> a, a time <laughs> somewhere please. between yeah. like 15 or 18 months, yeah. and um, you know, they've tested them. They sort of uh, take away their access to the visual world by putting a piece of cloth over their heads. Um, what are you at, talking at about children? Children. You know like, what they like, you know, 15 to 18 months, and, 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 oh, and they, and they don't know. Of time, not just, oh, okay. no, 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 let I'd me like finish, to get the ethics let me finish, <laughs> that please, <laughs> it's probably worth finishing this, this um, discussion, because, uh, yeah, so, they, they, they don't know, that they, they, they don't know that um, there's an outside world out there anymore, it's kind of like, um, oh, the world is suddenly switched off, or, you know, I've shut down, or they, they don't have a representation um, that's clear enough that there's an outside world and, and uh, they're um, sort of distinct from that. And it's similar to the way some trainers test the intelligence of dogs. Mm. They throw tails over their heads and the dogs can't see the world anymore. Mm. And the ones who try and move, get the tail off their heads and recognize that there's something in the way of them actually seeing the world and it's just an object are the ones who you know, are reasonably well intelligent. But some breeds of dogs don't do that. They yeah, just yeah. sit underneath the tail and think that the world has suddenly gone away. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's how you pacify your crocodile. <laughs> Okay. Ah, <laughs> right. It's a good idea. You throw the Hessian bag over its head. Yeah, and all of a sudden, Australian the world's reference. gone. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So yeah, uh, about this uh, novelty. So if you were to define novelty, uh, or the the extreme novelty that you refer as experiencing something new or a new intersection of. Um, there are degrees of novelty. Yeah, okay. You know, there's radical novelty. The, well, the alien spacecraft lands and, and the five-legged yes. green thing yeah, yeah. gets the, out. There's that's something, novelty. Yeah, that's right. But you'd, you'd be able to adapt prior experience 
um, to be able to cope with that yeah. if if you're if you're smart enough. Yeah. If it's a green thing with lots of legs, you at least would be able to see it because yes, you've seen octopi before, or something. and you've yeah, seen yeah. legs Whereas, before. Yeah. If it was something that really was radically different, Radical you might not foreign. even realize that there was an alien standing in front of you. Yeah, it could have been a gaseous. like what is it, pan-dimensional psychic yeah. elves or whatever from the <laughs> yeah, Terrence yeah. McKenna? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Psychic yeah. elves. <laughs> I don't know what they're called. Yeah, I like gaseous pan-dimensional psychic elves. Okay. So yeah, they're, they're in front of you and you have no clue they're there. Yeah, that sounds like they have a flatulence problem. Ooh. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The pan-dimensional flatulent elves. Yeah. Uh. Now, I, I, I'm thinking though, it's about general intelligence and uh, the ability to correlate previous experience and and uh, cross-propagate into new environments or to other environments yeah. and, and be able to use learning from one particular scenario and use that to benefit in another scenario. Uh, but but that's what you're calling um, Ad novelty. Adaptation to novelty. Yeah, yeah. adaptation yeah. to novelty. So within a, within a particular domain where things are relatively static but you do get some levels of novelty, uh, require, it requires less uh, less rigor, less um, less complex models of the world to deal with novelty. But if it's um, something radically new, then you need something better. For instance, um, well, a few of my friends would suggest that you're really only consciously aware and, and conscious only when you're reaching these um, new types of novelty, like, you know, higher levels of novelty. Yeah. The rest is just machinery and you're not making That's really right. any choices. I mean, you're all not... of us have arrived home wondering how they drove. Mm. Yeah. yeah. It's exactly that. Yeah. You don't need it when it's habitual. Yes. Should we go inside? Yes. Yeah, we should probably move. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome to Melbourne winter. Yeah, it's like Amsterdam four seasons summer. in one day. Don't worry, it'll get warm again. Give it enough time.